welcome to the Sports Gazette International Women's Day Special with football legend Eni Aluko. I'm Sarah Wilmore, golf editor at the Sports Gazette and host of the Women's Golf Podcast. And I'm joined by two female sports journalists. I'm Yasmin Ryder, Olympic editor of the Sports Gazette and track and field athlete. Hello, I'm Tess Derry, a sports photographer and keen football writer. Eni is currently sporting director at Aston Villa Women, has over 100 England caps and won multiple honours for her playing careers at Chelsea and Juventus. Eni also has a first class law degree, is a renowned author and was the first female pundit on BBC Match of the Day. Eni was involved in a high profile racism case against the FA and thanks to her persistence for change, she finally received an apology five years after England manager Mark Sampson made racist remarks towards her and another player. Hi, Annie, how are you? Hi, Sarah, all good, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, we're all pretty good, thank you. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for joining us for this special International Women's Day podcast. No um, worries. When we saw the theme, choose to challenge we did think of you so we are very grateful that you're here and very excited to talk to you too cheers thank you um yeah it's uh it's a good theme it's a good sounding theme yeah so um what else are you doing for international women's day besides this podcast uh i've done quite a few talks actually um i did two yesterday which were which was really good i did one with deloitte um and uh, one with, I'm doing another one later on this afternoon. So pretty busy, but I, I always love International Women's Day because it's just a great chance to engage and have really good conversations. So, Yeah, you're, you're certainly a pioneer of women's football. You've got more than 100 caps for England, which is really impressive. And you've yes. inspired so many young girls. How important is it to you to inspire the next generation of female footballers? Yeah, I know it's really important for me because ultimately um, when I grew up, I didn't necessarily have lots of female accessible role models that I could see on TV. Um, so to to kind of be that, be what I couldn't see when I was growing up, I think is really important and it shows sort of the generational development for women's football. Um, so, yeah, I take it very seriously. Um but I also know that I'm not perfect. Um, so it, it comes with sort of, uh, sometimes it comes with a pressure that um, you, you don't want. You want to be able to kind of live your life and make your mistakes without um, being sort of scrutinized and judged. But ultimately I want to be able to, you know, to show that the best version of, of myself as a woman, as a black woman is inspiring and aspirational and, and others growing up can do it too. You know, that's what I, that's what I want to represent. That's what my, I want my purpose to be centered around, you know, inspiring others to be the best version of themselves and whatever they do. Well, I know growing up, you previously said that Serena Williams and the Williams sisters were a big inspiration for you. What impact did they have on your progression as a, as an athlete watching them play? Yeah, no, well, it, I think because it was very difficult to see female role models growing up in football, um, I kind of had to sort of get it from tennis. Yeah. Um, and so the Williams sisters, for me, were the sort of most identifiable thing to what I felt like I could be, um, although it was a different sport. Um, and they were just amazing. I remember putting beads in my hair like the Williams sisters and really trying to imitate them and copy them because you know that was the closest thing to sort of identifiable black female role models that I had um in sport and um you know I I have followed the Serena Williams in particular ever since um so for me it was like you know it was it was the closest thing because I didn't have many female role models in football um so they you know the Williams sisters were very much that that replaced that for me in tennis well, you you certainly had some difficulties through your professional career. You did receive some racist remarks from the former England manager, Mark Sampson, um, but you chose to challenge them in a way that no player had previously done. How did it feel to raise that issue and change the game for young black women coming through? Well, firstly, I'd like to say that, um, you know, my whole life, 
um, my my whole career is not defined by that that difficult yeah, situation. Um, you know, um, I think we tend to skip a lot of my life, which was very positive. You know, I had over eighty caps before um, that incident with with Mark Sampson um, happened. So. I, I, I really like to make sure that, you know, there's a lot of balance when we talk about this issue because, you know, I think it's very easy to, to think that my whole career was defined by that issue when it wasn't. Uh, you know, I had a very good, successful career prior to Mark Sampson becoming the manager. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a difficult time in my career. Um, and ultimately, I, I chose to sort of stand in my truth and understand that, you know, I was going to lose lose out on my England career as a result of that um, and standing against discrimination and, um, and just, dis- and, and racism. But ultimately that's what I had to do in that moment. Um, I had to be very honest about the culture that was, you know, in the England team at the time I felt and was treating people, you know, black women differently. Has the game changed as a result of it? I, I'm not sure. I would like to think that if, you know, if it happened again, for any player, you know, black, white, brown, doesn't matter. Um, they wouldn't be treated, you know, in the way I was treated and sort of being dismissed and, um, you know, a smear campaign being kind of, you know, through the media. But, um, you know, I look at the game now and I still think it's quite concerning in the sense that there's almost minimal diversity within the game. Um there's not a lot of black players, black female players in the England team. Um, the England team at the, at the moment is almost exclusively white. Um, so I don't know if we, you know, we've still got a long way to go. Um, but I would hope that my case helped to um, shine a light on some of the things that the game needs to improve on and, and, and sort of make sure that it kind of never happens again. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously bringing that issue to light definitely um, showed people that there was there was some issue there. But obviously you alluded to, you did have a very successful career. Um, yeah. Playing for England, Chelsea, Juventus, one of the most successful female footballers the country's ever seen, and footballer, not just female. What was the highlight of your career? Oh, there was a few. I've had a few. Um... I think in terms of, you know, uh, clubs, I think I was my most successful period was at Chelsea. Um, and I feel that I, you know, winning the FA Cup um, in 2015 was probably the most, the biggest highlight for me um, because it was the first FA Cup that held at, at Wembley. It was the first trophy for Chelsea um, of a long sort of a long period where we kind of came very close, but, you know, we didn't quite win. Um, so it was a very, that was a big, big moment for all of us and, and for me personally. Um, and then I think playing in the Olympics too was, was um, you know, an incredible experience. It was bigger than football, really, um, playing in the Olympics. It was, it was really kind of the game changer for women's football at the time um, in terms of like where women's football was before the Olympics and, and where it and sort of how quickly it, it became something respected by you know fans and media and all the leagues and the FA etc. So yeah, it's um you know I have many highlights, but those two stick out in particular. Yeah, well, we were talking earlier this week actually about the Olympics and how it changed women's sport, and it's really interesting to hear from you that you found that a defining moment in women's football. Um, and I know you obviously had a very successful career at Chelsea and Tess is actually a massive Chelsea supporter. And I know. She- oh, wow. OK, good. <laughs> so, yeah, I think she has a few questions for you about um, Chelsea and your other your other football career highlights and now working at Aston Villa. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to you about your role as a women's sporting director at Aston Villa. I wondered, since taking the role, what challenges you faced and also what you've really enjoyed in that time? Well, in terms of what I've really enjoyed, it's um, a quite a multi, you know, multifaceted role. Um, you know, I like the variety of the role. You know, I, I manage everything from recruitment to 
you know, the professional um, experience of the players. So everything from, you know, where we train, the facilities, um, uh, the, you know, the professional setup, um, nutrition. Um, obviously, I manage the technical team um, as well. Um, you know, and then off the pitch as well, it's kind of, you know, what's the brand of Aston Villa, you know, building that brand, you know, launching an education program called Students of the Game, which I'm very proud of, that invest in the education of, of female players and, and the club pays for pays towards tuition fees. You know, these are all things that I, you know, I work on sort of on a daily basis. Um, so those, the, the variety has been really, really good and it, it allows me to tap into different skill sets um, that I have. Um, I think in terms of the challenges, it, it's been, I think the transition from semi-professional to professional was a very, you know, was difficult transition in the sense that you're really changing mindsets. Um, you know, I joined Villa just before a promotion um, and it was a very positive time for the team and there was lots of, you know, positivity about promotion. But I also had to kind of have the message of, well, it's not going to be enough, necessarily going to be enough when we, when we go to the WSL, which is one of the toughest leagues in the world. Um, so it was about recruiting more players. It was about pushing for more. It's about challenging for more. And often people people resist that. People resist change. People resist, um, uh, you know, moving to the next level. Um, it's a bit like you know when you're in the gym and you've got a personal trainer and you think five rooms is enough, but he's pushing you to do eight. You're gonna hate. You know, you're gonna you're gonna dislike the personal trainer in that moment. Um, and that was kind of my job to push it to the next level. And there was some resistance to that. So that was challenging, but nothing that, you know, um, we haven't been able to get through. And I think that, you know, this season, the WP, uh, WSL, it's been challenging um, and results haven't gone our way for the most part. But I think, you know, there's been a lot of learning and a lot of developing and hopefully we, we can reach our objective at the end of the season of, of staying in the league and, and continuing to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's really positive um, that there's so many more women's teams now and and more coming through uh, from, you know, support from the men's teams, also providing, you know, more funding and stuff for the women's teams, which is is really positive. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, one of the, um, I mentioned the Olympics. I think one of the benefits um, after the Olympics was that, like, a lot of the professional men's teams then started to see the real value in you know, having equivalent women's teams. Um, so what you had was, you know, lots of professional players being able to have the opportunity to play professionally with in professional with professional resources, you know, with a with a really good financial backing from, you know, the equivalent men's teams. And I think if you look at the WSL now, it's pretty much a mirror of the Premier League, you know, in terms of every single club in the WSL bar, I think Bristol is a has a Premier League men, men's equivalent which I think says a lot for the model of, of sort of how the women's game is, is, is developing, um, you know, and now we can start to tap into fan bases as well that are sort of existing fan bases of, of the men's game. So it's really promising. And I think the league has come on leaps and bounds um, and the FA have really kind of really done well in, in sort of developing the league. Yeah, absolutely. And um, are, are Aston Villa actually doing anything to mark International Women's Day? I don't think so. Um, not that I know of. <laughs> I would. I think I would know if they were. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, we also have a very busy game schedule. So often, yeah. you know, with all the good intentions, you know, playing games is the most important thing. We've got a big game against Manchester United this weekend. So, maybe there was not enough time to fit it all in and get players to come. Oh, actually, I, yeah, you're, no, I, uh, sorry, rewind. Yes, we have done, um, we, uh, Cadbury is a sponsor of um, our Students of the Game programme and Cadbury is also a sponsor of the club, um, a club sponsor. And I think there was a, there was a, um, there was, there was players doing uh, uh, an IWD um, campaign with with Cadbury so yes we have done something sorry excuse me that's good <laughs> after Greg's uh, Greg Clark's dismissal by the FA um, after making discriminatory comments it's quite clear there needs to be a more diverse board 
Is chairman of the FA a role in football that you would consider taking on? Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why? I mean, I, I think I, I definitely not now. I, I don't think I'd be, you know, I'd be ready or have enough experience for that role now. Um, but certainly, you know, in future, you know, why not? Never say never. Um, I'm passionate about the women's game. I'm passionate about the men's game. I'm passionate about football. Um, I understand, I think, now um, what executive life looks like, the business side of the game as well. Um, but, you know, that's something I need to continue growing. Um, I've just started a finance, football finance course as well to understand sort of all the all the sort of financial side of the game as well. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm as well versed in the game, business side of the game as possible. And I'll continue to kind of to take opportunities within my career that that elevate me um but you never know but certainly not certainly not now <laughs> yeah. do you think it's uh, realistic that we'll see a female chairman of the FA in our lifetime I'd like to think it is I think I like I'd like to think that is a realistic aim um I think the question almost implies the problem you know the fact that we even say is it realistic means that Nowadays, we we still we still don't have enough women at leadership roles in some of these sort of traditionally male dominated areas. Um, so we have to try and change that. I don't think you can go from zero to one hundred straight away. I think you know if there's, for instance, if there's ten seats at the table, you start from going from one to maybe three, and 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 that starts to change the influence in the culture, and then three to five, and that changes the influence in the culture. So. I think we have to change incrementally, but certainly it, it needs to improve. Um, and I think women also need to see themselves as capable of those roles. Um, traditionally, I think women sab- sabotage themselves and say, "Well, I haven't got enough experience," or "You know, I haven't, um, you know, I haven't uh, done enough to be considered to be a leader or an executive." Um, and often, men who are less qualified apply anyway. <laughs> so we've got to we you know as women we need to keep putting our name in the ring as well to make sure that we are we are part of the, the conversation absolutely and um I guess as well as these leadership roles it's it's important to have sort of more female coaches uh involved in the game as well yeah absolutely I, I think we do have a really healthy amount of female coaches now certainly in England and I know there's a whole sort of pathway scheme for female coaches at the FA um, that the FA created. Um, I think the most important thing for female coaches is to gain experience, um, is to make sure that they're gaining sort of real life experience in the game because nothing can beat that. Nothing can beat learning how to win on the touchline, learning how to make in-game decisions, learning that, you know, sometimes all of the tactics that you you may have got ready for may be completely different when it comes to game day and being able to adapt to that. Um, I think that's one of the most important things. It's, it's, it's gaining the experience again, putting yourself up for, for jobs and roles or coaching jobs and roles that will give you that real life experience because for all the co- course courses that we do for all the coaching courses that we do, nothing beats real life experience in my opinion. Um, you know, I did a sporting director course um that was really good but no you know there wasn't a coronavirus course there wasn't a coronavirus module (laughs) no one could teach me how to deal you know no one could teach me how to manage as a sporting director within a global pandemic no of course you know so so it's about and you guys will know that as students yourself like you know it's great to learn kind of the theory but once you get into the actual role that's when the real sort of learnings you know we we sort of apply so um that's what I would always encourage for female coaches really really try and get out there and apply your knowledge amazing thank you oh hi Annie um lovely to meet you and chat with you today I'm Yaz by the way Um, I just wanted to touch upon the progression that women's football has made over the years um but firstly often people tend to compare men's football with women's against one another um, yeah. I just wanted to like see what you thought about this and whether you think that they should be kept as separate entities or treated as um, separate entities. Um, I think that 
I think that the comparison is sort of to be expected because obviously football is the same sport. Um, but I definitely think um, it, it should be, it, you know, it should be seen as separate entities because I think the women's game has its own nuances that should be celebrated. Um, you know, I think the women's game is probably a bit more friendly not well definitely a bit more family friendly um i think that the women's game you know there's more emphasis on tactics and skill um as opposed to sort of pace and power um so i i think there's there's lots of beautiful nuances within the women's game that you know shouldn't be compared to the men's game um but i think that we have to kind of accept that you know there will be comparisons because men's football has just been around for so long um but you know we should we should find ways of celebrating the women's game as well um and not sort of be overshadowed by it yeah that's really interesting actually in your opinion what more does women's football need to do to continue its growth yeah it's a great question i think that for me um i think the the the, the next step really is to um is to kind of make sure that all of the, the, we've had lots of sort of breaking records in terms of broadcasting, um, particularly for World Cups and European Championships. Mm. And often the fan base um, sort of comes out to watch um, every four years, but it's translating that now to, um, you know, weekly. So it's being able to say, you know, how do we make sure fans are coming every single week to watch women's football versus now and again um and i think once when you do that then you're going to be able to create sort of a a whole economy for women's football you're going to have paying fans coming every week you're going to have the broadcasters investing more you're going to have brands want to invest more because you have a a live audience every week coming to watch the game um i think that's the next step and i and, and i think we really need to figure out and that includes me as well like figure out how and why that's not happened yet Um, like whether we need to change when the season is, maybe we need to change when we play games, whatever that may be to be able to say, you know, how do we carve out a market for, for women's football? I think that's, that's really important because that, I think that's the the game changer for women's football is to to build a fan base. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that the, um, the demand is there. It's just having it kind of a bit more regularly and seeing it maybe covered more would be great. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's about it's about making sure that um, you know that coverage you can you can kind of relate it to a, a fan base that wants to come every week. You know, fans are creatures of habit. Like you know, you we've become creatures of habit. Like in terms of our entertainment consumption, you know, you 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 watch Netflix. You know, you, people like to watch Netflix and watch a series and every single day they'll tune into that series in the same way people want to consume football in that way as well um every week you want to say right I'm going to the football women's football still doesn't really have that it still doesn't really have that regularity of of of, uh you know consumer habits so we have to try and figure out how that how we get to that point because I think once we do it will take off but I, I have a lot of optimism about the women's game because ultimately, if you look at the last 10 years, um, we haven't, like, it, it was nowhere near what it was now. Mm. And so that says to me that in the next 10 years, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be another very incredible, you know, exponential growth. Lots of exciting times ahead then. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> What do you think the main barriers women's football is facing today? I think that's it. I think what I just said in terms of like just fans still feeling feeling like it's like not good enough to pay for or it's yeah. like it's not, um, it, you know, it's not as good as the men's game. And there's kind of all these kind of stereotypical comparisons that just um, prevent the game moving on. Um you know, for example, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of criticism around goalkeepers in the women's game, for example, but, you know, a man, a male goalkeeper can make the same mistake in the women, in the men's game and the whole gender is not questioned. 
yeah. you know, <laughs> in the women's game, a, a female goalkeeper makes a mistake and it's, oh my God, women's football is terrible. No, that the goalkeeper made a terrible mistake. It doesn't mean the whole of the, the gender is terrible. You yeah. know, so we still have, we still have that problem where, you know, one sort of issue of the women's game or, you know, the whole of women's football gets questioned and gets on, is put on trial. Um, so we, we just kind of need to try and move away from that and just create more sort of um, loyalty within the women's game and respect within the women's game for what it is. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a shame that um, women's football gets scrutinised a lot more, it seems, just a bit unfair towards them compared to the men. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think you, you say it's unfair. I think it's part it's part of the game. I think, you, you know, once upon a time, we wanted more scrutiny. We wanted media to care. We wanted people to actually care about what was happening. And now we do have that. That comes with, you know, that comes with criticism as there is in the men's game. So I don't mind criticism. I think when the criticism comes, it's like the whole of your gender is questioned. So it, it's what the criticism is rather than the criticism. Uh, you know, I don't I don't mind if, you know, a pundit in the men's game says, oh, you know, that striker should have scored and, and they're a woman. That's totally fair. That's totally fair criticism. You want that. You want that analysis. But you don't want that to be well, because that striker didn't score, the whole of the women's game is not even worth watching. Do you mm. see the difference? Yeah. Um, that's whereas in the men's game we don't do that. We don't say, "Oh, the men's game, the whole men are terrible because you know one of them just misses Mr. Chance." It's just it's a little bit ridiculous, but that happens a lot. Yeah. No. That. Thank you for pointing out that. Are there any specific reflections from your career where you really found that society has kind of turned a corner or starting to move in the right direction towards um like the women's game and the growth of women's football yeah I think when you see like when you see um female pundits now on tv talking about the men's game or you see you know female athletes on make magazine magazine covers um and things like that you know that's that is huge progression because once upon a time that just wasn't the case it just didn't happen mm. um when you see um you know uh, viewing figures record viewing figures for women's world cup in comparison to the men like breaking the men's records that just didn't happen you know so there's been so much progression there's been so much to kind of really celebrate um, and it's about saying, how do we make sure that that continues, that upward trend continues? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you agree, but certainly during the pandemic, it's kind of felt like a lot of the hard work to close the gap between men and women's sport generally has kind of been a bit undone. Um, how do you feel um, to see like, women's sport being cancelled or postponed during that pandemic while men's sport was able to continue? Yeah, no, it's it's super super frustrating, um, and I, again, I think a reflection of where the women's game is still is in comparison to the men's game. Um, but I think we've got to remember, you know, the women's game was banned for fifty years, so mm. it's just not going to be where the men's game is. I think once we accept that, then we can sort of move from a realistic place. Um, I think the finances still aren't there to justify you know there was a lot of money spent to get men's football back um and actually you know a lot of clubs have lost a lot of money Mm. um so there was a lot of finance spent to kind of do the testing process and everything like that which just the women's teams just don't have um so that was frustrating because obviously it showed a disparity again in terms of finances But eventually, I think the FA were able to sort of secure funding for the women's game to continue at certainly the elite level of women's football to continue. And that's progress because once upon a time, it just wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't even have a season. There wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't even be in season right now. Yeah. So I try not to, you know, I try not to, I try and focus on sort of positives. Um, And, you know, let's also be honest, I think in the grand scheme of a global pandemic, football and sport wasn't the most important thing. Um, so yes it was frustrating but also I think we realized that like look you know it's more important to sort of make sure that people are safe and the Mm -hmm. NHS is you know is not under pressure and things like that 
Um, so everything was put into perspective. I think that's such a positive message also for young and inspiring female athletes, um, specifically in football, to see the funding from the FA that had, wouldn't have happened in previous years. So that's a really positive step. Yeah, it was positive, certainly for the top of the game. I think obviously people will say grassroots sport got cancelled as well, but grass, I think grassroots sport across women and men got cancelled. So there was no sort of discrimination in that. Um, I just think the pandemic has caused a lot of issues everywhere. So you can't really complain. It's like, you know, it's, no, it's not, a global pandemic is not ideal for anyone. No. Um, so it, it's, I've just, I've tried to kind of, have a very appreciative approach to it because you know I'm working at a club that we've been able to work through the pandemic we've been able to continue our season and so I feel bad to even complain you know and in that sense I think that's um something that we've all looked to especially in the, in the middle of a pandemic is those little little daily wins exactly exactly and I think I think it's a really healthy perspective to have yeah no, thank you, um, Annie, for speaking to me. I'm going to pass over to Tess now, I think. Thank you. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you actually a couple of questions about uh, England and their prospects in the near future, because um, obviously a uh, new manager and Serena Weidman coming in in September. Do you think, you know, looking at her previous success with the Netherlands and Euros glory in 2017 and runners up to the World Cup in 2019, do you think maybe she could be the answer to bringing England success in the form of trophies? Yeah, 100%. I'm really excited about that appointment. I think that, um, you know, Serena Weidman has really kind of transformed the Dutch national team to a world superpower, really. Um, obviously, they won the European Championships in 2017 and then went on to the, you know, the World Cup final in 2019. Um and you know they have world world uh world sort of leading players in players like Vivian Medema and uh Daniel van der Donk and, and you know these players. So she comes with a lot of pedigree, winning pedigree. I think you know, for the last 10 years, in England have kind of um you know, England have become sort of serial um semi-finalists you know 2009 under Hope Powell obviously got to the final and then uh, there was you know the World Cup semi-final in 2015 and then another semi-final in 2017 and then another semi-final in 2019 so bringing in someone like Weigman will will hopefully push it to that next level to take take England to the final and learn how to win Um, I think that's the next step and I think she's definitely got the ability to do that Absolutely. Um, also talking about sort of your your personal career, um, I watched you many times for Chelsea. Um, I'm a big fan. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you mentioned earlier sort of, you know, how how amazing it was when you played in that first FA Cup women's final held at Wembley um, in 2015. And, you know, it had a record attendance of their, over 30,000 fans at the time. How significant did you feel that that was? And, and looking back on it now as well. Oh, it was so significant. It was honestly really, it was probably the most significant uh, day of the history of the of the of the club. Because I think prior to that, we were kind of just like playing second fiddle a lot to other teams. And you know, the the season before we won, we got to the, you know, we we got to the final day of the season and and we lost the league on the last day. And you know, we kind of felt like a failure. I certainly did and felt like we just couldn't get over the line. So that day um, at Wembley was really a kind of the start of a whole winning culture, a whole winning mentality that was really going to start the the transition from what Chelsea was to what it is now, which is, you know, they win a trophy every year. Um, and, you know, once you catch the bug of winning, you, you, you're addicted. You know, so 2015 started that we caught the bug and that was it. That was it then. It was like, we've got to, you know, everyone wants to win every year, every year. So it was really, really significant game, you know, a massive game changer, I think, for, for you know, for for Chelsea. Absolutely. And, and on that note as well, um, obviously Emma Hayes has had 
you know such amazing success with Chelsea um, yes um and you know her recently being linked with uh League One's AFC Wimbledon um yeah I mean do you think this is an appropriate you know position for her to take or do you think it's it's a goal that women should be aiming for in football well, I think it's I think it's an appropriate conversation. Um, I definitely think that we need to be having the conversation around women um, working in the men's game and women having the capability of managing in the men's game. I think Emma Hayes has one of the best jobs in the world managing Chelsea women, and I think that it should be seen in that way. It shouldn't be seen as women's football or men's football. It should be seen as I'm managing one of the best teams in the world. Um, you know, in terms of Emma Hayes. Um, I think Emma Hayes is definitely capable of managing a men's team at the top level. I think that, you know, the idea that, you know, the equivalent to, you know, working with World Cup winning players at Chelsea is AFC Wimbledon is a little bit insulting to those players and to Emma Hayes. But I think, you know, the conversation, it brought that into focus. It brought that sort of, um, it brought that sort of question into focus. Like, what, what, what is the same you know, what is the equivalent? And the equivalent is the managing men's World Cup winners and Champions League winners. Like that is the equivalent. It's the same game. So I was kind of happy that that conversation came up because it meant that Emma Hayes could really, um, you know, really address what what I think has been a kind of assumed position of the women's game. And I think if there is anyone who's going to be able to do it, it's going to be Emma Hayes in terms of, managing in the men's game at the top level yeah she's been absolutely amazing <laughs> yes she has she really has so any you spoke earlier that success on the pitch comes with criticism and there was a time where you were fighting for that criticism and for women's game to receive coverage and to be analyzed properly um social media also seems to be that sort of place where Yes. It's where that women can express themselves, but equally they do receive criticism and some of that criticism isn't always about what they're saying, but it can be specifically sexist um, yes. in yes. your experience of social media. Um, my experience with social media has been that, like it's it's been a lot of sort of racist abuse. It's been sexist abuse. It's been, um, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, when I've you know when I speak on the men's game, um, but I think social media for everyone is pretty toxic because you know it's just giving people license to just express their own hatred, um, and it's kind of unpoliced in that way. Um, ultimately, I think you know I treat social media like a diet. You know, I wouldn't eat McDonald's every day because I know it's really bad for me. In the same way, I don't go on Twitter every day or in you know well, particularly Twitter every day and, and read what people are saying. I just, I know it's going to be bad for me. So um, I, I sort of consume it in moderation. I use it sort of when I want. I, I use the block button a lot. <laughs> and um, I I moderate what I take in and I moderate who I follow. And I follow lots of inspirational accounts. So when I'm on it, I see, I do see a lot of positive stuff. And obviously, you know, keep up with the news. but. I think that's the way we have to consume social media because otherwise it will it will control us and we won't control it. Um, and so I have a much more, a much healthier relationship with, with social media now and I ignore sort of the people that want to use it to spread their hatred, really. Do you see any um, positives in social media, perhaps as a place where women can come together and celebrate each other's success and progress that's being made? across not just sport but society in general yeah for sure there, there are positives in terms of you know obviously you know being able to unite and get get a message across and make sure that you know support is being shown you know widespread support is being shown around the world it's definitely made the world smaller as well so you know you can connect with women you know all over the world through social media um so yeah of course there's positives to it but I think I almost feel like we're getting to the point where the negatives have outweighed the positives and we just need to be so careful about, you know, how we're using social media. Um, 
but yeah, there's definitely the right way to use it, and um, it's it's pretty powerful in that way. Yeah, well, um, Sports Gazette recently spoke to Max Rushton, who's the host of the Football Weekly podcast, and yeah. he, spoke, he spoke about social media as well, and said that to start with, he did try to argue against people, but then he felt that that actually gave them airtime. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He now actually enjoys the idea of just totally ignoring them and that they're shouting at a brick wall effectively. Um, right, exactly. But also he did say that he was very fortunate that none of the comments attack his race, gender or sexuality. You mentioned yeah. there about the block button. How do you respond now and how have you perhaps responded previously to any unpleasant comments that you receive online? Yeah, I, I sometimes used to engage in it, which I think, you know, is a very human response that like you want to be able to kind of say, how dare you or you know, how can you say that? But ultimately, you're, you know, you're dealing with people who are just, you know, who are probably really unhappy in their own lives and are really kind of, you know, they have nothing going for them with their own life. So they come and attack you. Um, so there's just really no point in, you know, engaging with idiots really. Um, but I also think there is, there is, there is sort of time to help to ed try and educate people. Like if people don't know something, you can help to kind of say, well, you know, that's racist because of this, or that's racist because of that. I tried to do that. Um, you know, yesterday I was tweeting about Meghan Markle and sort of, you know, what I feel is very racist um, sort of media campaign against Meghan Markle. And, you know, a lot of people sort of tried to come with the whole, well, you know, it's not racist because, and it's like, well, you know, I, you know, this is why, you know, this is why it, 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 it is a pattern it is stereotypes typing it is kind of vilifying you know and, and and some people you know may learn something from that may understand that there's a different perspective so I try as much as possible to use social media but I find Twitter very reductive you can't really have a nuanced conversation on Twitter because the whole point of Twitter is to kind of be very kind of them and us it's a very divisive platform I think and you know, I find Instagram a much more positive um, platform and you can control, you can control sort of much more positive conversation. So, Yeah, well, I, I definitely agree with you there. Um, I've had an Instagram account for a few years now and decided to join Twitter about a year ago. And it definitely feels like a more confrontational social. Yeah, it's super toxic. Yeah, it's super toxic. And that's what I'm saying. Like you have to, you almost have to treat it like a diet, you know, just you know don't don't consume it every day you know it's not it's not good for you yeah and obviously we're we're just starting out our careers in the media so to be able to hear from you about the best <laughs> yeah. dealing, dealing with things is really really helpful um you yeah spoke it's very good to be you know it's very good I think as media people in the media to be aware of how your writing or your your platform can really um affect other people um I think for a long time journalists have always just been like well I have the freedom to be a journalist it's like yeah you do but you also have to understand like your use of words your use of stereotypes your use of that that really kind of can play into a lot of the the racism and division and hatred in society um so it's really good that you know to be conscious of that and and understand how you are communicating as, as a journalist because people really consume that people take it as gospel and people take it as true you know well I know that's something that all three of us are really keen to do is to make sure that our journalism is accurate but also that we're making sport and sports journalism a positive place to encourage others to be part of our community um you've spoken about self-validation and how feeling confident in yourself enables you to feel free on social media and not care so much about likes and shares how did you build that self-confidence and what advice would you give to other young women and girls um it's taken a while I have to admit it's taken a while to build that self-confidence um I I I've I you know when I was younger I was kind of somebody that really wanted to be accepted and liked and you know I really spent a lot of time trying to kind of 
convince people that oh I you know I'm worthy to be liked and um you know that's quite a dangerous place because you know the same person that can applaud you can be the same person that sort of um turns their back on you or or criticizes you as well um so I think it's really about making sure that you have the ability to to to, to love yourself and, and have enough confidence within yourself and validate yourself um so that the external validation is just a bonus um I think there's a lot of power in in being able to say no I I believe in myself and to look in your mirror every day and 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 to have the voices in your head that say no I'm good enough I, I'm 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 good enough to do this and when you fail equally be able to say okay I failed but I can go again and I can learn from this this situation um I think that's when you really feel feel powerful in life you really feel like um you know, you can really dictate your own happiness if if you if it all starts from you. That's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Annie. What do you think needs to change with social media to reduce a lot of this hatred that seems to get shared around? Yeah, I think it's pretty simple, to be honest. I think that it's, you, you, I think on Twitter in particular, I think we need to have more accountability. Um, I think everybody on Twitter should have, um, unless you're exempt and you sort of have, um, you know, a privacy matter where, you know, maybe you're a journalist in, I don't know, war-torn country and you have to keep your identity safe. I think unless you have some special exemption, I think everybody should sign up to the the the, the uh, platform with an ID um, and, and I think what that does is that it makes Twitter face like Twitter's faceless I think now it makes it sort of much more accountable to identity um, it stops people creating different accounts to troll I, I find it hilarious because people argue and say well my privacy and, and it's like well if you see look at all these fitness apps you know it, it, you, you look at all these sort of fitness watches you know, literally everything down to how much you sleep, you eat, your heart rate, your, you know, when you pee, everything is measured. Like, so, and people are quite happy to give that information away on apps, but, but don't want to do it on Twitter. It just, it, it boggles my mind. Um, so I, I, I generally think that's the answer. And I think Twitter need to really be honest now and make that happen because once upon a time it was, the argument was, well, you know, um, we, we're just the, we're just the postman. We, you know, we, we, we are, you know, in terms of Twitter is the platform that just kind of delivers the message. We don't shoot the messenger, but, but then they sort of disabled Donald Trump's account. And I was like, oh, so you can do it. You can, you know, completely disarm someone's account if they're spreading hatred. So I, I, I think now is the time to really kind of step it up and, um, you know, to, 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 to just create more accountability on those platforms. Yeah, well, it's certainly, it feels frustrating that, especially like you alluded to Twitter there, it feels like they try to just appeal to popular opinion and who they right. like, they do. And it's frustrating that people can hide behind this wall of anonymity. Um, right, exactly. I think yeah. once that's taken away, to be honest, you will see a lot less... Um, you, know, you will see a lot less abuse. You know, it's like any, it's it's human behavior. You know, people don't just walk out on the street and commit a crime in broad daylight unless you're really mad. In you know, on, but if they're if they're anonymous, they're probably more likely to. Do. Um, on Twitter, it's the, there's the the anonymity and the anonymity is the problem. I think, um, and the minute you kind of lift that veil, I think you will have a lot less. Um, abuse for sure yeah I can agree with that um just a final question from us any um drawing on Sarah's question about advice for young women and girls if you could give one piece of advice to young and inspiring sportswomen today what would that be for sportswomen um I definitely think it would be I'll give you two <laughs> I think the first one would be, um, it goes back to what I was just saying about self-validation. I think that's super powerful. And I think that, you know, when you, um, when you realize that the applause is, you know, the external applause and the white noise 
is dangerous and actually your internal applause is what's most important you really go to another level in terms of your internal power and, and your internal ability to to navigate through life so I would really encourage that um you know really really get to know yourself better and, and develop your self-confidence and surround yourself with people that equally make you feel good and make you feel confident and can be honest with you from a place of love and I think secondly it will be about use your voice that like use your platform use your voice inspire be positive tell people it can be done tell other young girls it can be done through through just showing what you do on your platform I think that's super powerful as well yeah they're two great pieces of advice thank you very much thank you any thank you so much for joining us today um you you're welcome really insightful and very lovely to talk to you you're welcome thank you and I wish you all um all the best in, in everything you're doing in your careers um you know the future I think that the future is definitely female <laughs>Some inspiring words to finish there from Eni Aluko. Tess, Yasmin and I really enjoyed chatting with Eni for this Sports Gazette special. Thank you so much for listening and we'd like to wish you a very happy International Women's Day.